I want to thank the organizers uh, for the event, for inviting me to uh, talk about uh, uh, Nelson Mandela and the, uh, and the, and the South African struggle. Uh, one of the things that was clear in a lot of the coverage in December when he when we lost uh, Mandela was the coverage tended to be very tendentious, that is, it tended to be very selective about what it wanted to focus on. And what I'd like to do today is to sort of correct, try to correct the record and uh, bring to you the real Nelson Mandela, uh, the struggle in South Africa. And based on something that Mel just said a few minutes ago, I think what I'd like to do is to try to wrap it in, bring in what we did here in St. Paul. Uh, in the uh, 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, around the anti-apartheid, the anti-apartheid uh, movement, uh, I think there were three key uh, elements that go a long way in explaining the end of the apartheid uh, regime uh, in South Africa. First and foremost, of course, was the the resistance on the part of the people in South Africa, and uh, that resistance was crucial. And I'm old enough to remember some of the earliest stages of that resistance, at least, during my lifetime. And it had a big, big impact on us, and it explains the second fact, the second fact that was crucial in the overthrow of apartheid in South Africa was the, the mass mobilizations, the international anti-apartheid uh, anti movement. We were dependent uh, on what was actually taking place within South Africa itself, the struggle within South Africa. So the ups and downs of the struggle, we couldn't, we couldn't invent uh, the movement. Uh, we had to take our cues from what was actually happening within South Africa itself. And so it went through like all struggles. All struggles go through ebbs and flows, ups and downs. And that was the reality in South Africa. And the third factor uh, that was very much absent, very much absent in the coverage of Mandela's death was the role of the Cubans and helping to defeat the racist South African military machine in southern Angola in 1988. Uh, that was true. That's what forced the regime to the negotiating table. And thus began negotiations about negotiations. And eventually, it's almost now, it'll be 20 years this April, actually. Uh, the first free elections uh, took place uh, in, in South Africa. And so that's the broad framework I want to begin, begin with. I come to this issue of South Africa because, in part because of my own uh, autobiography. I grew up, along with my sister here in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, during a period of racial segregation. And we saw the Jim Crow systems, and we saw the changes. And one of the things that we had the advantage of is actually living through a mass movement, a successful mass movement, to actually witness victories along the way. And it gives you a sense of how things can in fact change. And, but in many ways, the South African struggle brought me into uh, politics, act, active politics for the first time. I'd already, I'd already, of course, been a part of the civil rights movement, consciously and unconsciously. Uh, my parents were very uh, conscious, my mother especially, about the developments in Africa, in fact, thinking about uh, our brother from Ghana uh, in 1957 when uh, Ghana became independent, uh, we celebrated it in my, in my household. Uh, that, was the, that was part of making the connection so with, with, uh, with uh, uh, South Africa. And then in 1960, in 1960, uh, there was a protest that took place in South Africa against the very vicious pass laws in South Africa, all Africans were required to carry what might be called a pass. It was like an internal passport. And you had to have it on you at all, all times. It controlled your activities. And so there was a protest against the pass laws in the 1960s at a town called Sharpville. It was a peaceful protest where people burned their passes. And the police fired on the uh, protesters. Uh, in March of 1960 and killed 69, 69 people in schools of other people who were wounded. That's what brought South Africa to global attention for the first time and in a way it had not really been. Uh, 
obviously there have been struggles in South Africa going back to the very beginning. But in terms of really the global attention to the struggle in South Africa, this, this massacre called the Sharpsville Massacre uh, is what to really, really directed world attention uh, to the South African struggle. And it had a major impact within South Africa. The organization that Mandela belonged to and was recruited to was called the African National Congress, which was formed in 1912. So it just had its birth, birthday a couple of years ago, uh, centenary, uh, about two years ago. And for most of its history, the African National Congress tried to pursue peaceful, peaceful methods of struggle. Uh, not unlike the civil rights movement uh, in this in this country, uh, but the massacre, the Sharpeville massacre in 1969, forced the African National Congress to reconsider, to reconsider its its strategy. Even before the massacre, there had been a debate within the African National Congress about whether or not trying to employ the courts the limited electoral space that existed, trying to lobby, whether or not that was, was that really effective? And the young people within the African National Congress, led by Mandela, began to debate, have a debate, this was in the late 40s, early 1950s, and began to say, look, I think we need to pursue mass protests, taking to the streets. And so in 1952, began what was called the Defiance, the Defiance Campaign. And it was met with a lot of brutality on the part of the, of the police. But people were still convinced that they could pursue militant mass actions in the streets until the Sharpeville Massacre in 1960. And uh, the debate took place about whether or not peaceful methods were adequate. And the membership and the leadership decided that they would pursue armed struggle uh, after the Sharpeville, after the Sharpeville <coughs> massacre. And it was a very intense debate. Uh, the leadership uh, had for a long time resisted the re resort to armed struggle. And at that moment, in fact, when the decision was made to resort to armed struggle, and to form an armed wing of the African National Congress, the head of the African National Congress, Chief Albert Luthuli, was on his way to, uh, to uh, Sweden to get the Nobel Peace Prize for pursuing nonviolent non activities. What a contrast. <laughs> so at that very moment when he was receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, the African National Congress uh, had decided to form an armed wing, and Mandela uh, was asked to head up the, up the armed wing. So Mandela, as part of his responsibilities, uh, left South Africa to go abroad, to go to other countries in Africa, newly independent countries, to see if they could get assistance, the training that was necessary to carry out, to carry out an, armed, an armed struggle. And that involved visits to Ethiopia. We, we learned that the, uh, the Emperor Haile Selassie probably spent two weeks in uh, Ethiopia uh, trying, uh, uh, getting, uh, getting assistance. Uh, he also went to a number of other countries in North Africa and so on. And I'm also, told, I didn't know this, I also went to Israel uh, for a very brief, brief, I just found this out a couple of days, a couple of days ago. But it was because of his visits and so on and trying to get assistance that the CIA began to tail him. And he was arrested when he got back into South Africa. The CIA, the United States Central Intelligence Agency, had provided the South African authorities with uh, information about his activities. And this is when he was, he was arrested. And he was brought to trial in the spring of 19 in 1964. I was a first year graduate student at Howard University uh, at that time doing the African studies. And my professor, one of my professors had actually been uh, a, uh, was a white South African, had actually been one of the four, four representatives to represent 
uh, the black population in the National Assembly of South Africa. In under South Africa's constitution, no blacks could serve in the 160 person National Assembly. The best they could do was to have four whites who would represent them in the National Assembly, four out of the 160 representatives. One of them was this professor of mine, and he was the one who kept us informed about what was going on. He was in exile. He had been forced into exile. After the Sharpeville massacre in 1960, the government declared a national emergency and so on, and placed limits on on uh, civil liberties, freedom of assembly, the African National Congress was banned, other organizations were banned, and so uh, this professor left and taught it, began teaching at Howard University. And that's when I encountered him and learned a lot about the, uh, about the South African struggle. As I said, Charlottesville had already had a major impact on me when I was an undergraduate, when I was in under, undergraduate school, and the first I think the political speech I actually wrote was about the Charlottesville uh, massacre. And I began to read as much as I could about South Africa. And I came across this <coughs> mag magazine called Drum, Drum Magazine, and it had a big impact. Drum Magazine was sort of like the Ebony Magazine of South Africa. And all the images and so on really made the connections for me between the African American experience and the, uh, the black South African experience. So I, I was really involved became really interested in South Africa. So with Mandela's trial in the spring of 1964, a group of us graduate students got together and decided to organize a protest in front of the White House. We had no evidence that the White House was connected with the trial and arrest. <laughs> but we assumed Washington was somehow connected with it. And that's why we decided to, to protest in front of the, of the White House. And, indeed, and years later, it was discovered, indeed, that the CIA indeed was involved. In his, uh, in his arrest. So uh, he was, uh, uh, at his trial, he did something his lawyers didn't want him to do. And that is, he said, yes, uh, we were involved in armed struggle. Uh, his lawyers had tried to convince him not to admit that, and perhaps that they would be more lenient and so on. He said, no, uh, I think it's important for the world to know to be clear on what we were actually doing. And indeed, he did that uh, after trying to explain that uh, we resorted to armed struggle only after we had tried peaceful methods. Only after we had tried peaceful methods and peaceful methods didn't work, uh, we, were, we were fired upon, we were massacred and so on. Only then, reluctantly, we could be. And he explained that the first method of armed struggle was to carry out sabotage activity not to go after people's lives, but to attack some of the, the uh, uh, electric, electric, uh, electrical systems, uh, other kinds of infrastructures, uh, security infrastructure systems within. So that was the, that was the first, the first uh, part of the armed on, on campaign. And only then, reluctantly, did they form the armed on, on wing known as the Conto Wave or Spear of the, the Nation. So he made all that very clear, left, left a record for all of us uh, to know exactly what had, what, what had happened. And so he went to prison for that. And uh, we felt it was a victory in part that he was, wasn't executed, that is, we were able, the international campaign uh, uh, was, was public enough, well known enough, I think, to prevent the authorities in South Africa from actually, from actually ex executing him, but sentenced him to life. Uh, to life uh, uh, in prison. The, uh, the campaign, the struggle within South Africa uh, in the aftermath of his arrest, the trials and so on, went into a decline. And I remember attending uh, the uh, uh, meeting that took place at the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C. It was the first campaign to call for a boycott uh, of South Africa, and one of the key organizations I remember was the SDS <coughs> Students of a Nonviolent Democratic Society had called that meeting. And it was where I met a number of South Africans for the first time. People like Hugh Masekela, the musician, uh, uh, at that meeting. Uh, other young people, one of whom, very sadly, uh, Nat Nakasa, who 
committed suicide shortly after that. This was, and his suicide, in many ways, registered the kind of demoralization that began to set into the movement. And it really wouldn't be until another decade, until the Soweto <laughs> uprising in 1976, that things began to move, began to move uh, in, in, South, in South Africa. <laughs> And again, we were dependent on what was going on there in South, in South Africa itself. And at that, and the Soweto uprising is what brought into existence our committee, divestment committee here in the twin, in the twin, in the twin cities. Let me just say that one of the reasons for the upsurge in 1976 was the independence that Mozambique which is on the north, northeast border of South Africa, had just obtained in November of 19, 1975. That had a big impact within South Africa. It gave people hope. Uh, Mozambique became independent. You had people in South Africa who had relatives in, in Mozambique. If they could become independent, and maybe we, we could. And so that, that, had a, that had a major, major impact. And another factor, and I only found this out when I visited South Africa the first time in 1978, was the military defeat that the South African army had suffered largely at the hands of the Cubans in November, December 1975 and January of 1976. When Angola, another country to the north of South Africa, became independent in November of 1975, South Africa invaded with the intent of overthrowing the government there, because that government was, was an ally of the African National Congress. And the South African government rightly felt that if Angola becomes independent under the leadership of a government that is friendly to the African National Congress, the African National Congress would be able to set up bases, guerrilla bases, within Angola. So South Africa invaded uh, Angola to <coughs> overthrow the Angola government. And the newly independent Angolan government called on Cuba for assistance. So that was the first time Cuba would go in. And the Cubans went in about 30,000 Cubans and defeated the South African, pushed them out of Angola and was able to, was able to uh, keep in place the newly independent Angolan government. When I went to South Africa for the first time in 1978 without any prompting on my part, I asked some of the youth in Soweto, what, what were some of the factors <clears throat> that explained why you all went in motion in 1976? We had mentioned Mozambique, the independence of Mozambique. And secondly, the defeat that the South African army had suffered at the hands of the Cubans. It had a big impact on it because this mil South Africa's military was seen as impregnable. It was seen as the most powerful military machine in all of Africa. And the fact that it suffered this defeat in Angola at the hands of all of these Cubans, that you can imagine this, it gave heart to young people that this, this, this machine can be, this military <coughs> might, in fact, a machine can, in fact, be undermined. It can be, it can be defeated. So all of those were the background factors that explain why in uh, June of 1976, <coughs> Young people took to the streets to protest what seemed like a kind of an innocent issue. Namely, they were protesting the fact that they were forced to use Afrikaans as the medium of instruction in their schools. And Afrikaans is a language, one of the languages of the European language, is in South, spoken only in South Africa. And for these young people, why should we be forced to learn the language of our oppressor? And so they began to protest against the use of Afrikaans in the schools. And they took to the streets. And they took to the streets in mass protests, and more than 500 of them were killed, mostly shot in, in the back. And that put the South African struggle, thanks, uh, on the global agenda for the first time in a way it hadn't been since 1960. The last time it was in 96 Sharpsville. In 1976, it's back on the agenda. And within months of the Soweto uprising and so on, we formed a committee here in Minnesota, in St. Paul, and we met religiously every week at the Halle Q. Brown uh, uh, Community Center. And uh, our uh, committee uh, brought together people from diverse political groups. We had different, 
as any kind of committee like this, you've got people of different opinions and so on, different views and so on, but we came together, united around the uh, fight to support and provide solidarity uh, to the South African struggle, including, including divestment, getting U.S. corporations to pull out of South Africa, be a part of this international campaign. And there was a, there was a local business in the neighborhood on Selby Avenue, not far from Dale, called Control Data. I don't know if people may remember Control Data. <laughs> oh, yeah. the control Data was there and uh, prided itself on having a number of black employees. It was, it was really doing great for the neighborhood and so on. But it was also in South Africa. It was also doing business in South Africa. And so we decided we would uh, picket uh, the, uh, uh, the control data uh, office there on, on, on Selby. And we, we, we chose the moment to do it because we had a visit of one of the student leaders of the Soweto uprising, came to the Twin Cities as a part of a national, international tour. And we thought that it would be great with, his, with him being here that we would have this picket line. Well, th those of us who were in the committee started getting calls from the uh, control data uh, officials wanting to meet with our committee, asking us to call off the the protests and so on. And they sent one of their vice presidents, after they couldn't convince us to call it off, they sent one of their vice presidents, uh, very appropriately named Jim Bowie. <laughs> Jim, Jim Bowie made it very clear that if we went on ahead and carried out this protest, they, he couldn't be responsible for our safety because the workers that are in the plant would see our protest as a threat uh, to their jobs. And so we had to meet that night. We had an urban league uh, uh, called us in, tried also to convince us. So we met with them and decided we would call off the protest. And we would uh, have uh, the picket line in front of control. Days. Rather, we would have a mass meeting uh, in the Hallecube Brown, uh, in the Hallecube Brown uh, uh, Center and so on. And we decided because we felt we hadn't done adequate homework within the community, within the black community, to explain to the community exactly why we were doing this. And so we didn't want to jeopardize, we didn't want to jeopardize anybody, put anybody in a, in a, in a vulnerable position and so on. It was a lesson that we learned the importance of going into the community, explaining exactly what we, what we were doing, how it links to why the fight in South Africa was relevant to the fight here you know, within, within the United, United, States, United States. Well, the, uh, the Soweto uprising in 1976, in hindsight, we couldn't see it at that time, was the beginning of the end of the regime uh, in, South, in South Africa. It was the beginning of the end of the regime. Yes, there would be ups and downs, uh, but it was really the beginning of the, of the end. And the, uh, the protests against South Africa began to coincide more and more with the release of political prisoners. And Mandela, in many ways, would have been forgotten in prison from his imprisonment in 1962, 1964, and so on, really had been forgotten. But with the uprising again in 1976 and so on, uh, Mandela and others and other political prisoners are remembered. And they are, they are the people, they, they, they benefit from this, from this upsurge that's taking place. Led by the led by the young many of the young people. I remember we talked to some of the young people who came here from many of them simply didn't know about Mandela and stuff. For them, they were simply historical figures. They really had no they had no information. One, one of the realities about South Africa, and I remember when I first visited there in '78, was to to be in a bookstore and you're reading through a book, and all of a sudden you see neatly cut out sections of pages, even just a strip. Somebody had to go through books there and cut this out and so on. And it was a part of what was called the banning laws in South Africa. Anyone who was in prison or in banned in South Africa uh, could not have their name in print. You were a non-entity. Any literature about you uh, was banned. The basic ideas of the African National Congress is very important. I should come back and talk a little bit about the, the program of the African National Congress called the Freedom, the Freedom Charter, uh, 
which was uh, formulated in 1955. This was the basic program uh, of the African National Congress. Its central idea was South Africa has fallen, but everybody in South Africa, black and white, that was the central theme within the African National Congress's freedom charter. Well, that was a banned item. You couldn't, you couldn't obtain it. To have it in South Africa would be against the law. <clears throat> you could go to jail and so So it's understandable then why a lot of the young people simply didn't know about Mandela and so on. What happened is after the mass uprising, the Soweto uprising, the students, though, many of them had to go into exile. Their lives, they would have been in prison. And so what the African National Congress was able to do was to rejuvenate itself. The, ex the exiled African National Congress now had a layer of new recruits to them. These young people who had just gone through the struggle had gone through the battles with themselves. And that really is what rejuvenated the African National Congress. Put it, put it on the map, on the map again. And Mandela increasingly begins to be seen as the figure who will be able to play, play that important role. And so the fight comes, let's get Mandela out of prison. For many of us, we were very nervous about what, was he alive? What, what, what condition and so on he was in? Uh, when I was there in 78 for the first time, I was on a ship, and the ship pulled out of Cape Town, and it passed Robin Island while he was imprisoned. And it was in the middle of the night, and I uh, had no, I couldn't see anything new at all. And so all you could do was imagine. It had been rumors about the regime had perhaps uh, made it, incapacitated him in some way. Rumors that perhaps a lobotomy had been uh, performed on him. Uh, all kinds of things. So we had no, no idea what, what, his, what his status was. So he becomes almost a mythical, a mythical uh, figure until people began to actually visit him and in, the 19, in the 1980s. And uh, he is clear that he's as cogent as ever. And he has functioned in prison in a very disciplined way. He's, he set an example how, how to function in prison. That is, how to maintain your dignity, how not to allow your captors to uh, think that they've actually weakened you in any kind of fashion. It meant having to put aside all kinds of feelings. Uh, when uh, the few times that uh, Winnie would be able to come, his wife would be able to come and see him, couldn't touch her and so on, uh, not being able to to actually have physical contact uh, with his wife, uh, with his relatives, although he was one prison guard. You may have heard the story about who, who uh, broke the rules and allowed him to hold, uh, hold his, grand, his grandchild for the first time. <coughs> a big, big, imp big Im impact on him. But he, but he learned how to function in a discipline, in a collective, in a collective way. And he knew this was important because the regime was constantly trying to the prison time to try to break him, try to break him politically. He refused, he refused to allow that to happen. In the spring of 1988, South Africa decides to invade Angola again, tries to overthrow the Angolan government again. And the Angolan government asked the Cubans, will you come back and help us? And this time the Cubans said, yes, we will. We're going to make sure that South Africans can never do this again. And so the Cubans sent eventually 300,000 people uh, to uh, Angola, and they defeated, decisively defeated uh, the South Africans, pushed them out. And Castro was very clear, you, and, and I didn't know this uh, until uh, shortly ago, reading some of his speeches that Castro gave as early as 1986. Castro was saying that the defeat of South Africa in Angola will, be, will pave the way to the end of apartheid in South Africa. He sees this strategically at least two years before the actual battles that, that, that take place. And indeed, that defeat, that defeat is what forced South Africa to the negotiating table. And the immediate beneficiary of that defeat is the liberation movement in Namibia, the neighboring country of Namibia. It gets its independence in 1984. South Africa had illegally occupied Namibia uh, since, the second, since, the first world, since the First World War. It becomes independent in 1989. And then 
Mandela, of course, was released from prison in 1990, in February of 1990. This for us was a culmination in many ways of the work that we had been doing with millions of other people around, around the world, here in St. Paul, in greater Minnesota. Uh, this was indeed a major, major victory. There's something about Mandela's biography that I think is important to to keep in mind. I didn't get a chance to talk about it. It's very important. And especially as we're looking at the reality of the world in which we live in today, in which people oftentimes subscribe, unfortunately, unfortunately to what I would call tribal, tribal mentality. Mandela talks about one of the important things in his life, in his youth, was when he was able to leave his village and go to school outside of the village he grew up in and to begin mixing it up with people who were different from him, who came from different ethnic groups, different tribes, and so on. And then when he went to Fort Hare College, this was the segregated college uh, that existed in South, in South Africa, but where people from various backgrounds, various ethnic backgrounds came together, and he says this was, this was crucial. It's the first time he really had a chance to learn about people from different ethnic groups and tribes. One of the realities about apartheid, the apartheid system, was to try to promote tribalism. The, re the regime had understood, and like all regimes, you think about it throughout history, <coughs> most regimes are minority, and a minority has to figure out how do you stay in power. Right. You can stay in power by playing off groups against one another, right. playing off one ethnic group against one another. And in Africa, in British colonial system, something called indirect rule that the British perfected us. I always say that the British perfected us because they had a long experience with tribal politics and how rulers play off one tribe against another. When the Romans went into the British Isles, this is one of the ways in which the Romans were able to conquer the British Isles, by playing off the various tribes against one another in the British Isles. And when the English go into, went into Scotland, playing off one clan, against another clan. Yep. And so this policy of divide, divide and rule was perfected by the regime in, in South Africa, apartheid. apartheid. That's what apartheid was about, to divide people on the basis of tribal lines. Uh, you were not a citizen of South Africa, you were a member of a particular tribe. And if you wanted any kinds of rights, you had to go and live on the tribal lands and so on. That was the, so for Mandela going to Fort Hare, going to the secondary school and did to Fort Hare, and mixing it up with people from other ethnic groups and so on was a big, 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 big difference in his outlook and his, and his perspective. A second development, he says in his autobiography, was in 1947, 1948, after the Second World War, when the working class in South Africa began to mobilize and to go on strikes. Uh, in many places right after the Second World War, because of the nature of the war, uh, prices were kept artificially, wages were kept artificially low. Uh, and after the war, prices went up. And so workers, not only in South Africa, around the world, including here in the United States, the biggest strike wave ever in the history of the United States took place right after the Second, Second World, World War. And that was the case in South Africa. And that, Mandela says in his autobiography, had a big impact on him. This actually to see the working class, to see these workers in the streets and so on. And began to feel a sense of the importance of the working class. The other development at the same time was the colored population. That is, the people of mixed race, the coloreds as they're called in South Africa. They began to mobilize in massive numbers. And also, as well as the, the Indian population, people of East India, people who have come from India who were living in South Africa. As some people may know it was in South Africa where Mahatma Gandhi came into politics. He had to deal with the system of racial say, had never witnessed anything like that in India. And it was in South Africa. And he, he was politicized in South Africa. And he went back to, when he went back to uh, uh, India. So the Indian population had a long presence in South Africa. And the Indian population began to mobilize in 1947-1948. These developments, Mandela says in his autobiography, had a big impact. He began to see Indians and coloreds in a different way than he had seen before. And he had always seen them, like a lot of black South Africans, looking at Indians and coloreds as, because they were relatively more privileged 
yeah. relatively more privileged than black Africans tended to see them, well, I'm not, I'm not sure they are our allies. And so he was one, he, 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 saw, he saw them in motion, saw them in struggle and so on, and began to see them as, uh, as allies. And it was out of that that he joined, uh, we didn't know this until at the end of his life, that he became a member of the South African Communist Party. Uh, that was one of the things that many of the obituaries, the official obituaries, uh, did not, did not uh, 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 acknowledge. And uh, he said that experience though, allowed him to mix it up for the first time with white people, with white South Africans. He had never really, because again, the reality of South Africa, the, you, the regime is, it's a divide and rule strategy of the regime. He never really had a chance to collaborate politically uh, with white South Africans. For the first time, he was able to do that within the South African, within the South African Communist Party. And so th those experiences, I think, are very important because it, they, they help to him to grow. And it suggests that you know, none of us are locked into any particular kind of, of identity or any, any, uh, 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 any kind of frame of mind. We're all able to grow politically. In the same way that Malcolm X. Malcolm X was able to grow political. This is what Mandela was able to do to grow political. And all of that made it possible, I think, to explain the kind of person who came out of prison in February of 1990 and why indeed he was able to, to take on the leadership responsibilities that he was able to do. And he was unique in many ways. You think about there are many struggles around the world, unfortunately, have not had Mandela's, people of that caliber, to be able to provide the kind of, the, provide the kind of leadership that was necessary to bring about the, the, the first democratic South Africa, the first democratic, I stress this, because there's some of us, including myself, I was guilty of this, thinking that what was on the agenda in South Africa was immediately a socialist revolution. Some of us thought that that was what was on the agenda. We read the, the Freedom Chart, uh, the section about nationalizing the, the mines and so on. We read that, oh, that's a socialist. We ignored something that Mandela wrote in 1956 about the Freedom Chart. In 1956, he said, no, 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 it's not a, it's not a socialist program. It's a program though, to bring about democracy, radical democracy, a real democracy for the first time uh, in, in South Africa. And for him, there was no incompatibility between, between that and a socialist project. Because in order to get to the socialist project, you really had to have democracy. You had, the working class needed political space. The working class needed the right to vote, the right to hold meetings, the right freedom of the press. The kind that have the kinds of debates and discussions, the civil debates and discussions that are necessary to move, to move, to move forward. So that's what that's what he led. I think it's in, to be clear because some people, some people are surprised at the kinds of social, economic inequalities that have surfaced uh, in South Africa. But those inequalities were always there. They were always there in South Africa, and they will always be there as long as you have a capitalist economic system, that's, that's the reality. I, I don't have to explain to anybody in this room, you look at what's happening in the United States over the course of the last decade. The, the one percent or the one-tenth of the one percent versus, what is it now, 400 people in the United States have more wealth than 150 million people. 400 people have more wealth than 150 million people in the United States. That's you know, half the population. So those inequalities in wealth, that comes with the reality, the reality of a, of a capitalist economic system, especially at this stage in its, in its development. The main thing we have to ask ourselves, is the working class in a better position now to go forward, to fight to end the historical, its historical oppression? South Africa is probably the only place right now in the world where the working class is actually winning, being able to win wage gains. <clears throat> in most places, think about the United States. <laughs> you don't even have to talk about the workers in plants and so on. 
look at the Minnesota orchestra. So workers are being locked out. Wages are being cut. What's going on in Detroit right now? The news yesterday, if you have a pension, your, your pension is going to be cut by a third. That's the news from, that's the news, latest news from Detroit. The workers are, in most places are losing, are losing fights and so on. South Africa is one of the few places in the world where workers are actually winning, getting wage increases. Platinum mine is out on strike at this, at, at this moment. And, and, and most encouraging is to see farm workers, farm workers in South Africa. Farm workers in South Africa were almost like peasants, or like serfs, were treated like serfs in South Africa, especially in the, in the wine growing areas in the, Western, in the Western Cape. You got paid with wine, part of your pay. It was the top, the top system. That's one of the things that the Freedom Charter demanded we're going to get rid of, we're going to get rid of. But almost in a semi-feudal condition, farm workers are mobilizing, winning wage gains within within. None of that would have happened under the apartheid system. Wouldn't have happened under the apartheid system. So I think the gains that were made for the working class as a result of the overthrow of the apartheid system and so on are gains that we should applaud. There's no apologies about. And, and see them as a step forward, as a way to advance and set the agenda, not only for workers in South Africa, but elsewhere on the, on the continent and else, elsewhere around, around the world. So I, I, I went longer than I had planned to, uh, to talk about this, and I wanted to really have an opportunity to, to dialogue with people and hear what people, people's questions are and so on, and have a discussion, because I can only highlight a few things uh, about Mandela and the struggle, trying to put Mandela in the context of the struggle, in the context of the struggle. There was a tendency, understandable, in the media here to, to highlight the individual. The, what makes the individual is the movement. So I can take, uh, I have to take hands, and I'll, I'll, I'll serve as kind of a I read that Time special edition on Mandela because I really wanted to understand what was happening. And um, it, uh, it, 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 you know, I thought about Winnie Mandela and I thought about, you know, the, that whole unfortunate thing. I didn't mm -hmm. understand it and after I read it, I felt like mm -hmm. I understood it. Do you think that um, the reason that Nelson Mandela came out to unite all the races was because he wanted to stop the bloodshed? Because it was because he felt that, I started thinking maybe he felt that the whites had all this weaponry in that mm -hmm. And that if, if he didn't step in to do that, that they'd be more slaughtered. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my thinking was, was he just kind of biding the time to help the black masses to at least live, to become educated, to maybe be able to take it, you know I'm getting at, in another direction, or I, I'm trying to figure that out what it, I didn't feel it like it was a hopelessness. I felt like it was a strategy, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I wasn't really sure that there was talk that he had really given in. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I was wondering about that, but there's no doubt you had to respect all those years this man who sacrificed his life. But I don't know, my question, I think so. I think so. Uh, do other people have a similar question, uh, perhaps, because uh, I do. I, I think it's important to realize that it was a negotiated settlement. It was a negotiated settlement. Um, the South African military was defeated in Angola. It wasn't defeated. Overall, yeah, you had this massive military apparatus in place. <coughs> the defeat it suffered in Angola is what allowed the negotiations to take place. It forced the regime to make concessions it didn't want to. When the negotiations began, the central issue is okay, if we're going to have 
democracy in the vote, then what kind of representation? The regime wanted a system of representation similar to what they had in Zimbabwe. That is, that you would have uh, blocks, uh, racial blocks, would be represented in the parliament. So whites would get a block of votes, blacks would get a block of votes, colors would get a block of votes, and the Indians and so on would get a block, a block of votes. And the African National Congress said, no, we oppose that. We want one person, one vote, a system of one person, one vote. And every time the regime resisted that, uh, the ANC went to the streets. Masses of people went to the streets. Masses of people. And those mass mobilizations, those general strikes and mass mobilizations, forced the regime, forced the regime to make that concession. Um, big issue around, the big, the, the, what it was not able to do was around the question of the property question. The regime was forced to make a concession on the issue of the right to vote, one person, one vote. What it was not willing to do, because it went to the very heart of a capitalist economic system, was the question of property, private ownership of the means of production. The regime insisted that that be enshrined in the Constitution. That had to be enshrined in the Constitution. And if you understand, that's the, yeah, as a capitalist, you, if you don't feel that your wealth, your property is protected, you're not likely to invest as a state in a, in a place. Even before the negotiations were completed, you had a lot of capital flight out of South Africa. A lot of capital flight was leaving, was leaving South, South Africa. So that, on that issue, the ANC was forced to make a concession. There's no doubt at all about it. And therein goes a long way in explaining the economic inequalities. If this had been in a place like Cuba, where you have, you, you, th you, you thoroughly defeat the regime, you defeat it on the battleground in total, then you can bring about the kinds of changes that the Cubans were able to do. That wasn't possible within South Africa. You were right about the, the bloodshed, and that, that was ignored in a lot of the news coverage and so Leading up to the negotiation, to the elections in 1994, the regime had been sponsoring and promoting quote unquote black on black violence. About 10,000 people lost their lives. I was there when I was there in 91. I really saw the effects of it. Uh, 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 funeral businesses, big business in, in South Africa and so on. Talk to people who have lost their lives or relatives and so on. And so again, what the regime is promoting is this black on black playing off in eth ethnic tribal conflict. And they find an individual, one of the chiefs, Chief uh, Bufalese, <laughs> they find the chief uh, uh, of Zulu, and he, is, he goes along with this black on black uh, violence. And so yeah, that was a, so yeah, so this was a, this, the re, so the regime was doing everything it could not to, not to make concessions. It fought to the back, to the, to the better end. And so yeah, it was a negotiated, a negotiated settlement because the regime had not been defeated on the battlefield. <coughs> had not been defeated. Just in Angola. Just in Angola was it was it defeated. I don't know if that helps a little bit. Can you just talk a little bit uh, also about the internal struggle, um, the United Democratic Front, the Mass Democratic Movement, and then also the external struggle with the ANC at that point still being banned. But those forces, as Mandela came out of prison, those forces played a huge role in setting the tone of the liberation. Yeah, you're perfectly correct. So part of the history simply didn't get a chance to get into. I sort of alluded to when I said that for a long time, the African National Congress was not really leading the process within, within South Africa. Uh, before Soweto, after Soweto, uh, other organizations came into existence. The Black Consciousness, something called the Black Consciousness Movement, led by Steve Biko, uh, came into existence. Again, it was kind of a, the ANC's leadership was in prison or in exile, and so 
And so new forces, new young people, new layers of young people, and sort of another movement coming out of the black consciousness, later the United Democratic, the United Democratic Front, represented this new layer, this new generation of people who were very active at the local level, within the neighborhood, the civics and so on, for example, all operating within the, in the neighborhoods at the local level. And there were tensions between the African National Congress and these these organizations for understandable, understandable reasons. And the African National Congress, I'm convinced, was eventually successful, however, because the African National Congress had a perspective about how to take state power, how to take over the state. To get rid of the apartheid system, you had to take the state. And while the UDF and a lot of the grassroots activists were the, did noble, many, many noble kinds of things. They didn't have a perspective, at least none of the organizations I'm familiar with, had a perspective on taking the state, taking over the state, and taking the state and therefore beginning to begin this process to dismantle the apartheid, the apartheid system. Uh, some people were integrated into it, some were not. These tensions exist today. Uh, the, the debates in the ANC, outside of the ANC, people who were in the UDF, who were never really a part of the ANC, and who are, uh, you might call someone like a Bishop Tutu, uh, an example of someone who was not an ANC member, uh, but came out of the mass movement, and so on, and his, his disagreements with the ANC today, and so on, uh, reflect, reflect that, that history. So yeah, it's a very important part of that history that has to be recorded. I'm curious about the role of uh, Chief Kutubezi after um, Mandela became president. Mm -hmm. Did he ever politically reconcile or the role of uh, Chief Kutubezi? Oh, yeah. yeah, within Qatar, within Qatar, within Qatar, within Qatar. Again, this was negotiated, so. <laughs> <laughs> and so the ANC is a part of the violence that was going to be so called black on black violence. The ANC Mandela in particular thought it best to bring, try to bring Booth Lazy into the fold. To bring him, make him a part of the government. And which he was, he was given the, uh, the, the justice, I think it was the Minister of Justice, uh, or the equivalent uh, in South Africa. And one of the unfortunate things about that is that that ministry also uh, controls immigration issues. And unfortunately, he used that position to, um, to scapegoat immigrants. And that's an issue within South Africa today that is one of the legacies of the apartheid tribalism. Unemployment, you got an unemployment rate of around 33%. Official unemployment. And the question of who has citizenship papers and who doesn't is an issue that we see in this country, we see in Europe, we see it all around the world. And South Africa is, is not exempt from that. But, uh, but Buthalaser didn't help. Uh, it was an it was a understandable attempt in order to undermine the violence that you, this black on black violence, quote unquote. Uh, see if you can bring Buthalaser's organization. Into into the process, and so that was the that was a part of the arrangements. And for clarification, Budulazi, Chief Budulazi was yeah. the head of the Zulu Nation, and they formed a political arm called Nkata. For those who know, right? Can I add a perspective to to Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my wife worked for the Electoral Commission at that point. Budulazi was invited to participate in the first democratic elections. So if you look at the ballot, you will see that the Nkata Freedom Party is pasted on the ballot in the 11th hour. They will finally accept that they will participate in the democratic elections. But they refused to participate right here. Good point, good point. August, what do you think is the future of the ANC? The question is, what is the future of the, of the ANC? I think there will be probably a split 
within it. I think the role that it played historically, a very important role. That role, that's, it's been, history has moved beyond that. And so the, um, it's, it's been able to last as long as it, as it has because the opposition hasn't been able to, to unify um, itself in a way to provide. So it's living off, the ANC is able to live, live off its legacy. And that, um, but its legitimacy, its legitimacy is increasingly being questioned more and more. And uh, I think the most important development over the course of the last month or so is the possibility of um, the uh, union movement, uh, some within the union movement, uh, forging an alternative, a work, working class party, a workers party. Uh, the, uh, one of the major mining unions in South Africa has recently called for breaking with the ANC. And the ANC is aligned with the trade union movement is something that goes way back. And I think that may be the cleavage, the beginning of the, is the most important, the most important cleavage, I think the most productive. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can just uh, say something personally. Um, as an ANC member, I uh, was in South Africa a month ago, and I was very upset about what's going on in the country because uh, our president is not doing what He's supposed to do so. There's a lot of unhappiness in the country on all walks of life. It went black, white, pink, blue. Everyone's upset with what the government's doing now. And I felt as an ANC person when I was there that I couldn't align myself with a group that's representing the ANC now because I think as an ANC member when it was under the old part of the ANC, that's what I stood for, that's what I fought for. And um, so when I was there, I was talking to some of the people and people were saying that, uh, Suma said that, oh, uh, we're going to win this election because we know that we have these, especially the older people of the ANC that will vote for us. We won't get up to thirds. But what is true is that the people on the ground will not vote for the ANC, even the older people, because a lot of them feel that they made promises they didn't keep. And they all made the promises. He, he, you know, he left and after Becky came on, they tried to do some of the stuff, but they never did that. So I was asking people, so what are you going to do? Who will you vote for? And they said, now, um, we go back to the default. The ANC has the history of having at least some experience in running the country. With the DA, with the Democratic Alliance, um, they be a position, but they be weak. So who do you vote for? You know, a lot of people said, well, we're not, we need to, we're not going to vote. But we'll, even if we don't, we're not happy with what the ANC is doing. We will still vote for them because at least they have a check. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to come as, about as strong as they did before. And that's what's happening in South Africa now. With news coming out saying yeah. that we will not vote as a block for the ANC in the movie. They told the members you can vote for anyone you want to. So there's a lot of change in young people coming into the politics now that they don't have an issue with the ANC. So they will, um, they're looking at other options. Like uh, uh, Malema, you know, mm -hmm. Malema might be made a fool of that, but he's not following. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit dangerous yeah, for South yeah, Africa yeah. when I think about it. But guess what? A lot of people go back and vote for the ANC. Sure. They might not come out as strong, but sure. I think they have a few years left. If they change what they're doing now, mm -hmm. they might be in the one. I don't think that's important. You've got to stay from an ANC person. <laughs> I think probably an ANC made a lot of mistakes early on, and I think all those things are adding up. The, uh, Fable's mistake with AIDS crisis, right? I mean, there's some glaring stuff. Um, the way they dealt with, there was a promise to kind of, uh, you know, there was, there was a promise to build houses. That was like a solid, remember, that was one of those concrete promises. One of those ones you had to feel, fulfill, especially early on. Otherwise, people will say right away, oh, man, you didn't keep your word, because it was, it's, it was such a glaring thing in South Africa, you know, got whole countryside with number 10 shacks. And so to, to actually create it, you begin to do a little, but not near enough. And so that hurt them. 
Um, clearly, you know, the handling of the mine crisis, you know, the, 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 the killing of those miners, they're opening people's eyes. And, and, and little townships are fighting and, you know, they're struggling against the same stuff they were struggling against during the apartheid regime. And so it almost looks like people's reluctance the people's uh, hesitancy to, to, to go away from the ANC reminds us of folks' uh, uh, reluctance to leave the Democratic Party alone in the U.S., even though conditions don't change much, you know, folks feel like, well, you know, it's a party of, it's not a party of Lincoln, by the way, it's a party of Kennedy. <laughs> it's a party of Kennedy and Franklin, and the people are thinking, right, the party of, 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 of Lincoln was the Republican Party. So, you know, you kind of flip flop. Uh, so they have that same struggle, and I think you're right, and I think but people's eyes are starting to open. All those mistakes and the fact that their people's conditions are not changing. Same thing happens to the rights movement. You know, when folks are fighting for desegregation, people look around and realize that a lot of folks can't eat it right now. It's been desegregated, so we gotta go deeper. There's something systemic, you know, and there were the systemic, there were people who were fighting for systemic change. Their voices were held down because, of course, you know, the government folks in power, they want to hear that, so they promoted the folks who were just pretty much pushing the anti-segregation and the social piece. But the economic folks, you know, were being held down. Just run, oh, okay, wow. I'm gonna run because when you were saying some of the years, 1960 and 1961, I was like, I'm oh, <laughs> <laughs> This has captured my attention. Um, so some of it I understand, some of it I know. One thing I wanted to say when she asked where the NAC is going, to me, generations come. Mm -hmm. And to me, what I see from the, you know, of the NAC, my cousin calls and tells me something, you know, sometimes the younger people, they're tired of the old ways. They're tired of talking, negotiating. We do see violence as, we get ready, like Tupac said, knock on the door, I'm hungry, I'll come in, you knock down the door, I'll come in. So when the younger generation is coming up, that's what is concerning me. How will the NAC start looking throughout the world now? Because it's new leader, Stephen Biko, I've heard of his name, I've read and learned about him. And then, I just have to add this, with Nelson Mandela, what, uh, what impressed me so much about this man and his aura is he was willing to really forgive. He, I mean, I could have did that. I would have had revenge, just some payback on my mind. But he <laughs> forgave, became president, and I heard that was a lot of things between him and Winnie. You know, people, why are you going to forgive him? So now that he has passed, there's a new generation coming up. And yeah, that, Nelson was a great man. He had this great heart. He was so noble, and he he was honest and true. But there, as we're we coming in, we taking on, and that's where I'm thinking the NA might be going in AMC in, yeah. in, yeah. in yeah. Africa. Yeah. They're tired. That's their land. Yeah. No more. Well, that was what you were referring to with the young. There are a lot of polls have shown a lot of young people are disaffected from the African uh, African National Congress. And uh, the uh, one leader, former leader, of the African National Congress, uh, Julius Malema, plays upon that sentiment, that kind of this, this, this affection. The problem with it, in my opinion, is that he, he tends to play the, the ethnic and the racial card, mm -hmm. and that the That is very problematic, in my opinion, given the history of the race question within, within South Africa. And I think the historical program of the ANC, that is, South Africa belongs to all who live in South Africa, is to me, that's the, that's the way forward. That's what we want to do. That's the best of the, the, best of the ANC. In, in my opinion, and so that's that's my. I was going to. Oh, I had a question. No, no, I was going to say, where is Wendy Mandela in this now? Where is her? How is she speaking about what's happening now? Uh, is she? Uh, I mean, she's still present. I mean, you know, still vocal or? <laughs> yeah, she she's still. I don't know what her relationship with the ANC is, uh, and Malema in particular. She was at. Funeral. She was a part of all the, um, the funeral oh, yeah. arrangements and so on. And uh, it, uh, I 
again, I might have a better sense of what the relationship is between the leadership and uh, and Winnie. Uh, but uh, I think she sees herself as a as a stalwart, as an ANC, mm -hmm. as an ANC stalwart. And uh, the uh, whether or not she sees herself having any kind of role in the future, that I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really because sometimes. Young people don't understand. You have to remember what the past is you know, instead of thinking, you know, they know it all. Right. <laughs> if, you, if you go back to our history, you find out that you got to talk, you got to get those things. Okay, let's say it's about for somebody. No, no, I just, okay. when she yeah. said they know it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question. I had a question for you about what I remember you as an ANC member. Um, I, I, since I've written about this, I, I have a theory about the ANC. One of the problems, the ANC was in some ways forced to enter into an alliance with the South African Communist Party in the early 1950s. And I think it was that alliance had both <coughs> negatives and positives. Mm -hmm. And the negatives, I think, really came out in the exile, in the, in the, in the, in the exile world. Uh, the functioning, the tendency to function in a non-democratic fashion uh, has its roots in the way the SAC CP function, and that, unfortunately, I mean that's that was that was the history. You could say that the, the, the hand that history had dealt the ANC, how to survive. I remember meeting and knowing people like Alfred Enzo and so on in exile in Tanzania and so on. And in many ways, the ANC could not have survived without the assistance of the South African Communist Party. Its ties to the Soviet Union, to Eastern Europe, and so on. It, it, it was in many ways that the PAC couldn't couldn't survive and so on. The young people who came out of Soweto, where were they going? What groups were they going to join when they when they went into exile? There was the ANC there. So it was a, an alliance, but I think the alliance came with a price about how to function, how to function internally, and I think they picked up a lot of bad habits because of because of that alliance. That's my yeah. My, my thing is, um, when I was um, a student, and in the 1970s, I was a student on the ground, and we um, we knew that we were seen as communists, we were seen as terrorists, because because of that alliance, the ANC was seen as a communist party. That's why they didn't get a lot of support from outside of the country until that time. And even though Badiba was in uh, Rotten Island, we were taught about it. I was taught, my aunt would sit with a candle and teach me about who he was, about the Golden trial. So uh, for a lot of us, yeah. we knew who he was, but we could never speak about him. We never saw a picture of him. We, he was like a mystic figure. So we knew he was there, but we never. Mm -hmm. We would go to mass meetings and talk about Mandela, free Mandela, but we didn't know what Mandela looked like. Even he was standing next to us, we didn't know that same. Mm -hmm. But there was people who knew him, like um, my, my father-in-law was just telling me that when they were living in Kirtan, where the freedom charter was, that next to the Leon's aunt's house was the room where they used to meet. Mm -hmm. So he would come in for the meeting and leave as a milkman, mm -hmm. and they would see him. They, they, they knew what he looked like, mm -hmm. but they could never describe him to anyone because you were not allowed to do anything, you know, not try to paint anything, to draw anything. So, But that alliance actually helped South Africa, and it damaged us yep. too. But um, we are where we are now, and I think we, we use the alliance if we can come out stronger with it. But at the moment, I don't think the, the Congress want to leave plays a big role in South Africa. They, if they are, they be quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, so, because as soon as you hear Communist Party, it becomes negative. Mm -hmm. You know, and people don't want to be associated mm -hmm. with the negative mm -hmm. thing in, in a party. I just want to add something else. What's with the, uh, what I read in this, it is a special edition of time. I think you understand like my and um, that the women said that Mandela was trying to be brought out of step with what was happening with the coming of the fall of the Iron Curtain. It changed that whole power. So I think that from what the article stated, he really had <coughs> learned to shift, having been out of the scene for so long. And uh, then on Winnie, I read that she has been appointed some role 
in the end see and she's called the mother of the country so we we can wait and see where that will go but for those who are angry i like moving in that direction i'm wondering will it be the same circling back to the same thing again that's a good point that's what I think Argus was talking about with the one candidate that was his name. Because, he, you know, he's, yeah, because, you know, that race thing isn't going to work. But it's, you know, it, this is kind of repeat history. You know, this is the tricks of the folks in power, the tricks of, uh, of, of, of the bourgeoisie. I mean, that's, that's one of the things they're going to use everything they can. You know, they, they use immigration, they use race, they use anything but to keep you from getting it to the real issue. I mean, I was hoping that you talk about uh, the, the Chris Hani uh, killing. I mean, there's no connection that uh, that the government, they were never able to connect Chris Hunt's mm. murder to the government. But I got to tell you, it's, who you talk about some circumstances that have, that work really, I think, on behalf of the government, because I honestly think, me and August may disagree a little bit, I think that the, uh, I think that the, the masses in South Africa were still pushing for even more reform. May, they may not have gotten it, but I think Chris Hani was definitely heading up, spearheading so, you know, some more economic stuff. And yeah. it seemed that whoever knocked him off was like the perfect time. Now they're saying the government said they had nothing to do with it, but boy, you know, they, you know, the right wing out of the said that, but man, it, it, you know, it, it worked too well hand in hand because some things that Chris Hani was pushing for seemed to kind of evaporate after after he died. It could be either side. And, and the other side of that was, right, when, when, when they killed him, it also created some unrest that, that they almost couldn't handle. Remember, that was, that was a real yeah, problem. That, you know? yeah, the, the, the one he woke up and we saw that Chris Hani was shot, we thought, oh gosh, here comes the blood mm -hmm. We were holding our breath, what is going to happen? So we were just told, the conflict just become, mm -hmm. and if I said, you, you come to people, and it was, it was like, everyone is holding your breath. It was, it was the weirdest time in South Africa. It was so tense because anything could have set off a blood Yeah, because that was the last drop. It was the last drop. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, Dr. News, I just want to thank you as both of us are South African. We marched and protested, and we were thankful to people like you who stood in the divestment campaign. I know there was a lot of pushback against it, and it will hurt the people. Yeah. But we said, what else can we do? Um, we've got nothing to lose. We actually entertained those. I mean, there were actually people who came to visit, because uh, I would came in the yeah. later half of the early 80s, but we set up a larger committee. And there were people who came and talked to us. Remember that? Oh, yeah. We had people South who came and talked South to us. Government would yeah, right. people their own, what we used to call them, their own batons. Yeah. Black South Africans came to talk to yeah, yeah. us yeah. and told <laughs> us that the investment <laughs> right, was hurting us. Yeah. Yeah. And then we got ANC representatives. Say, yeah, so we, yeah. we would actually have forums in yeah, the community sure, here sure. where they would actually get up and say, well, this is a bad part. Yeah. And so then we would get ANC reps and yeah. folks, those are exciting times because it's wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so like, you know, I, for me, it was, I said, my children are not going to grow up under the system because mm -hmm. our parents used to tell us, please don't do this. They're going to put you in jail. They're never going to see you. You're going to go to Rock Island. They're going to kill you. And I said, we were in high school when we started this. So we decided, no, if we have to die for this. At least we're going to die for the because but it's not going to happen on our watch. And that's why we're willing to go to the streets and, and shock at and beat them, chase them, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when you look back at we, really, you, you guys don't know what you did on the side because we didn't know anything that was happening outside of the South Africa. You, we, you knew more what was happening because whatever was happening, Whenever there was Andre, they were shooting us, we just didn't hear it on the news. It was like they didn't want to upset the white people in the country. So we asked the white person, uh, did you know what's happening? No, we didn't. The media was suppressed. So they, they mm -hmm. knew. We would get calls from the US, yes. people telling yes. us what's happening. Wow. You can see it on CNN. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. We, after 86, uh, the regime decided to, to make it difficult for us to get news. Right. In fact, uh, Henry Kissinger had recommended to the regime that they do that. Uh, but by then it was too late. But it reminded me of something that our mother, late mother told me. I was watching Eyes on a Prize with her show before she died and she was looking at some of those, the Eyes on a Prize. She said she didn't realize this was happening in other cities because the news was censored in the South. Mm -hmm. The news was censored. We, we, you couldn't hear about what was going on in other cities during the Civil Rights Movement. And that makes sense because I was yeah. I grew up during the civil rights movement. I remember telling people and laughing about it. I, mean, yeah. I remember telling you yeah. that you know I had to get to high school, I think, yeah. uh, to to know about what was going on in the civil rights movement. I mean, yeah. I was alive. Yeah. I was you know I was like six, seven, eight years old, and a lot of big stuff was going on. 
and I wasn't aware of it, yeah. and of course I wasn't mine. Yeah. So yeah. that you understand how that was a difference. That the way they dealt with the issues down there was we had a few leaders who negotiated away everything, and so it kept people from learning how to organize. That's what it really did. And so you didn't hear about stuff, and you had to read about. I thought it was oh, I didn't read about you know the Montgomery Children's March like you know like years later. I'm like I didn't know. Nobody told me anything about this stuff. You know I didn't know anything about it. And I'm down south pretty much, and we had some segregation in Miami, but we didn't we didn't know anything. Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for, for being here and to discuss the question of our comrades here. Yeah.